in this video, I'll be showing you how to estimate risk for a medical device. In fact, I'll be taking you through a step-by-step -step guide on how to estimate the probability of occurrence of harm, making it simple and easy to understand. We will be working with the hazard traceability matrix and using some examples. Hi, I'm Peter Sibelius, the founder of MedicalDeviceHQ.com and one of the experts that have authored the 2019 version of the ISO 4971 standard. This video comes from my online course, Introduction to Risk Management for Medical Devices and ISO 4971 2019. That is available on MedicalDeviceHQ.com slash ISO 4971. If you don't want to miss out on more premium content from my online courses, subscribe to my channel by clicking on the subscribe button. Not only will you be kept up to date with what videos I publish, but you will also be helping me reach out to more people that work with medical devices. I hope you will enjoy this video. Let's get started. If you look at the hazard traceability matrix as a reference of how far we've come in the process of risk analysis, you can see that we've gone through hazards, reasonably foreseeable sequences or combination of events, hazardous situations, and harm. The only thing that remains in the risk analysis is to estimate the risk. This means estimating the probability of occurrence of the harm that we previously defined and determine the severity of that harm. One challenging thing with risk analysis is that one should assume that nothing has been done to reduce the risk. It may sound odd, but you should, for example, start by thinking that the device has no packaging, no casing, no insulation on cables, nor any protection or warnings anywhere. It may not be sterilized or even cleaned, and you haven't thought about selecting biocompatible materials. Let me tell you why. Let's say we have chosen to make a jar of glass that will contain body fluids, because glass is an inert and well-documented biocompatible material. In the beginning of the project, we also discussed using plastic because it was less expensive. But due to the problems of extractables that may be harmful in the plastic, we chose to make the jar out of glass. That decision felt obvious to everyone. A few years later, a clerk at the purchasing department notices that the glass component of the device is unnecessarily expensive and asks a consultant to sort out whether the jar could be made of plastic instead. At the first look in the hazard traceability matrix, there is no requirement on making the jar from glass, even though there were a number of hazards associated with not selecting glass. So the selection of glass was actually in a way a risk control measure. However, the lack of documentation of risks associated with not selecting glass, along with the real reduction in risk, could make you overlook this risk when making future changes. Many more decisions than you think are based on risk. Why do you think a table has four legs instead of three? Always make a habit of documenting your decisions relating to risks with associated risk controls, because they are in fact just that. Another argument is that it may be wise to show how much your risk control measures actually lower the risk. Comparing the risk before and after risk control helps you check the effect of your risk control. That, in turn, can help you find mistakes and incorrect assumptions. For example, if a warning in the instructions of use reduces the risk more than a safeguard or protective measure, then you might suspect that a mistake has been made. You can easily do this check by multiplying PO with S in your hazard traceability matrix before and after risk controls to compare the resulting products. Last but not least, if an accident occurs and someone is injured and it leads to a trial, then it is much better to be able to show that you decided to implement insulation on cables, an insulating cover on the device, an earth connection, instead of just earth ground wire to reduce the risk, as opposed to just taking these risk controls for granted. Before we start looking at estimating risks, let's take a look at what risk is according to ISO 4901. In the ISO 4901 standard, risk is defined as the combination of probability of occurrence of harm and the severity of that harm. This means that something that is highly unlikely to happen, but with severe consequences, will get a median risk level. And the same could be said about a risk that is likely to happen, but with very low severity. Speaking of probability of occurrence of harm, it is very common to abbreviate it as in this example, with just PO. Also, severity is oftentimes abbreviated to S, as in severity. We are going to start by looking at how to estimate the probability of occurrence of harm. Please also note that when we refer to probability of occurrence of harm, it is really the occurrence of harm that we're focusing on. Not the probability of occurrence of the hazardous situation, but the actual harm. 
because not all hazardous situations will actually lead to harm every time, and it is the harm that matters. The most common way to assess probability of occurrence of harm, or PO, is by measuring it semi-quantitatively so that a certain probability of the harm arising is related to a number. For example, if the probability is greater than 0.01%, that may be represented by a 5 on a scale from 1 to 5. When I refer to PO, I'm sometimes a bit sloppy because I refer both to the probability, which is a number between 0 and 1, or 0 and 100%, and sometimes I refer to the numbered scale from 1 to 5. But strictly speaking, the 1 to 5 value is by definition not a probability, but I'm qu quite convinced you will understand what is meant based on the context. If the probability of occurrence of harm is less than, let's say, 1 in 100,000 patients, that would mean that PO is 3 on the same scale. You will need to document the probability ratings in a list. The probabilities in the picture are based on an example of such a list from the ISO 49001 standard, and it uses a logarithmic scale for probability. You don't necessarily have to have five steps on your scale, but normally you should not have less than three steps or more than ten. Fewer steps will give too few possibilities to differentiate probabilities from each other, whereas too many will be difficult to work with, practically speaking. If it's not already determined and defined from before in your procedures or elsewhere, a 5-point scale is in most cases appropriate. Now we've talked about the basics of estimating risk. One of the most common questions I get during my training courses in this area is, how are you supposed to estimate the risk? Most of the time people would be referring to how to estimate the probability of occurrence of harm. Let me tell you how it's supposed to be done in the perfect world. When you estimate the risks, you should ideally be finding information from any of the following sources, and this is in order of priority. Published standards or articles about similar devices. Statistical references to products that are already out on the market. Tests that you do to explore risks. Results of investigations and analyses. This could be calculations, Monte Carlo simulations, and, for example, fault tree analysis. Expert assessment, for example, when consulting internal or external experts on how uh, often things would go wrong or happen. Of course, it would be great fun and really good if we could all use published standards articles or statistical references for all the risks that we come up with in our hazard traceability matrix. That is, however, not the case in reality. What I will be saying next depends on what kind of product you work with and for how long you've been in the market. But if you have a brand new product and no one else is manufacturing a similar product either, you will find that most of your risk estimates are based on the last option, expert assessment. And this is just a different way of saying that we guessed. And knowing that most estimates are done in this way usually comes as a great relief to many people who are worried about these things. If you are making guesses, trust me, you are not alone. At the same time, if you have a critical risk and the consequences of not having a very reliable estimate of the probability of occurrence of harm are severe, then you may simply have to spend the time and money on tests or results or the investigations to actually determine the probability. This could, for example, be simulations or process validations or usability studies. On the other hand, if you're in the marketplace with lots of products that you've been selling for years and years, you're likely to have a huge amount of retrospective data that would support your estimates better than would be possible with a brand new product with no previous data meaning that you might be using risk estimates from all the top four categories, which most of the time would be considered more valid or reliable than expert assessment. So in short, how do you estimate the risk? Ideally, we should use solid and reliable data from published articles, standards, tests, or investigations, or you do a lot of guesses to the best of your abilities. Just don't do it when the consequences of making an incorrect assessment could be severe. When we estimate risk, it is the probability of occurrence of harm, or just PO, that we are looking for. This is typically what we would like to type into our hazard traceability matrix. The probability of occurrence of harm is in turn dependent on the probability of occurrence of the hazardous situation. But they're actually not the same, because not every hazardous situation leads to harm. Let's look at an example. In this picture, a patient receives some kind of injection. As soon as you puncture the skin, a hazardous situation occurs, which is that the patient is exposed to a virus or bacteria. And please do remember that when we talk about the initial risk estimation, you should think of it as if nothing has been done. Even though we have cleaned the skin and the needle is sterile, 
there could in theory be bacteria or viruses that you expose the patient to. In fact, I would argue that the probability of the hazardous situation occurring is close to 100%. Sure, it might not be many viruses or bacteria, but both bacteria and viruses are floating around in midair, so the patient is by definition exposed to them. The standard and most manufacturers refer to the probability of occurrence of a hazardous situation as P1. In this case, it would be 100% but it could also be much lower, which we'll be showing you later on. Even though the P1 equals 100%, it doesn't mean you will have an infection every time, 100% of the times that you use an injection needle. I don't have the exact number, but I think it's less than once in a thousand needle sticks. Let's take a look at the math related to this. The probability of occurrence of the hassle situation is P1. In this case, it is 100%. Because like I said, there are bacteria and viruses everywhere. And if we agree that you will get an infection one in a thousand times, there is another probability, and that is the P2. The P2 is the likelihood that the hazardous situation will lead to a harm. This in turn means that PO can be calculated by multiplying P1 and P2, which means that there is a 0.1% probability of experiencing an infection in conjunction with the needle stick. So now you are acquainted with P1, P2, and PO. There is actually more to it, so let's back up a little. Remember that we should start risk analysis with hazards. The hazard is a potential source of harm. The probability of the hazard occurring is 100%, because if, it in, if, it, if there is a potential source of harm in the product, there is a potential source of harm in the product, and there's nothing we can do about that. But whether the patient or people are exposed to it, that's a different story. And that's what we will be looking at now. After having identified hazards, we should look at identifying reasonably foreseeable sequences or combinations of events. In this case, I've added three events, A, B, and C. They all have individual probabilities. I've chosen to refer to those as PA, PB, and PC. They all need to occur in sequence in order for the hazardous situation to arise. In this case, it means that the P1 is PA times PB times PC. And in order to get to PO, the probability of the occurrence of harm, we need to factor in uh, the P2, the probability of the hazardous situation leading to harm, which in the previous example was extremely low. Finally, we end up with the probability of occurrence of harm being P1 times P2, where P1 is the result of the previous sequences or combinations of events and their respective likelihoods. When you have figured out what the probability of occurrence of harm is, you can find the right number on the right-hand side in your probability of occurrence of harm table and transfer the number to your hazard traceability matrix. Estimation of risk also includes determining the severity of harm. That is covered in another video. Do you want a template for a hazard traceability matrix like the one shown in this video? There will be a link at the end of this video that you can use to download a free hazard traceability matrix template. What do you think are the most common mistakes people make in this field? I will tell you what I think are the most common mistakes at the end of this video. Before doing so, please tell me what you think are the most common mistakes or challenges in risk estimation in the comments field below. And please do subscribe to my channel by clicking the subscribe button. If you want to learn more about risk management, I welcome you to register for my online course, Introduction to Risk Management for Medical Devices and ISO 14901 2019 through medicaldevicehq.com. I will take you through the whole process of risk management from start to end and teach you how to work efficiently with risk management for medical devices according to the requirements of the ISO 14901 2019 version of the standard. Then what are the most common mistakes then? One of the most common mistakes is that the probability of occurrence of harm is estimated after risk controls have been implemented in the risk analysis. This estimate should be done before risk control measures. Secondly, people don't agree on the basis for the estimates. What I mean by that is that some people think the probability of occurrence of harm refers to the probability that harm occurs during maybe one day or a week or a year, but another person thinks that it's per use of the device. Now, team members have to agree on the basis of the probability estimates. Otherwise, they might just argue even though they do actually agree. Thirdly, it's quite common that people try to estimate the probability of the hazardous situation instead of the harm. Now, probability of occurrence of the hazardous situation should normally be referred to as P1, 
and that multiplied with P2 will be the probability of occurrence of harm, or PO. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe or downloading the Hazard Traceability Matrix template for free on medicaldevicehq.com. Use the link. You will have to add it to your cart and then check out to download it, but it's still free of charge.